And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, welcome to the Weighing In Podcast, and we are honored to have one of the hottest coaches, a guy who has been just lighting it up with his main fighter, Sugar Sean O'Malley. Tim Welsh, how you doing, brother? It's good to have you on. Uh, doing really good, and thanks a ton for having me on the show, boys. Cool, cool, brother. Cool. Love having you on. So how how things been? I mean, look, it's what, we're a week fallout on all this stuff, right? I mean, how, how have things been? I saw a couple shows that you guys were doing. Sean was uh, recapping his fight. Just kind of give us a walk through um, the week after, and then, we'll, and then I want to go back and kind of start from the beginning. How was the prep for the fight? How was how was the week of the fight? I mean, this was a huge, huge event, you know, and headlining it. And, what, and we had heard, I had heard that Sean was thinking of pulling out of it because he was injured. No, 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 okay. no, no, that's not true. Okay. I mean, the All week right. after the fight, I mean, it's it's burning. He he's such a competitor, and he's just. He, he was having a tough time thinking of, God, well, what if I would have beat him? But we're trying to get him back on a good mindset, and he does have a good mindset. Mm -hmm. he, we, we've been in MMA long enough. We know eventually losses are going to happen, and uh, I think it just burns him that he just really didn't get beat up that bad and just kind of the narrative of the fight. Um, but, I mean, he's we, ha we had a good fight camp. We we did have a good fight camp, a way better fight camp than we did for Aljo. Um, but we still haven't been able to do wrestling and actual grappling practices for probably coming up to two years now. Mm. Um, we, we go in there and we'll do a little short 10, 15 second, 20 second goes on the ground from his guard or, or from the wall. Um, just kind of getting through these fight camps. I mean, with cortisone shots, cortisone shots in the hip and in the back and stuff getting through these fight camps so finally just get sit down and get this surgery figured out and be able to get him back in the wrestling room and back in the grappling room is gonna uh it's gonna be it's gonna be huge and a big relief for me because half the times i have a plan for the, what we're gonna do that day and it's like fuck no i can't mm -hmm. do that so we got to work around it so his mindset his mindset's good his mindset's good yeah, that's that's kind of a fighter mentality though. Is like, look, it is injured, and I I can work around this though. And you feel like you, I can still get my cardio in. I can still hit mitts. I can still still do some wrestling in terms of like sprawl, come back up, you know, get it back to the feet where I need to do most of my work anyways. I mean, you learn over time to kind of work around these injuries. And now they just become like, oh no, I can keep going. I've done three or four fight camps with the same injury that you just like. Oh, I've learned to work around it, and that's kind of what he's ha been having to do now, huh? Yeah, I mean, it seems like it. Everyone I see in the sport who's right about the 10 year mark is when all these lingering injuries start popping up and, uh, and, uh, yeah. And he's, he's been able to tough through it. He, he, I mean, the fight camp versus Aljo was absolute nightmare. Literally all we were able to do is hit mitts. And then you saw how that went. And then yeah. with Cheeto, I mean, he still was dealing with this. We can't grapple a ton. And then you saw how that fight went. So, I mean, the smart part of us would have been like, Hey, let's get this surgery now after the Cheeto fight. But he's like, no, I'm getting through these guys. Let's go knock out Marab. And then we'll, we'll talk about getting it. Yeah. But like I said, that's zero excuse for the fight because we did have a good fight camp. His mind was very, very ready for war. His legs were ready, ready for war. His heart was in good shape and he was ready for a battle. So that was no excuse. It's just Marab. Marab came out there and you can't take it away from him. He looked good. He had good timing on his shots, good penetration. He was patient at the beginning and you just, you can't take any way thing away from him. It was just a good game plan by him and, and props to him because sugar, sugar is a nightmare to fight and mm -hmm. Marab did a good job. My, my thought process on it, when I was watching Sean walk out and he first came into the venue, was it the first time you guys had been out there with all the screens on and everything like that? Was that the first time? Yeah, they, they kept us in the back. The whole time we were, I thought the day before they mentioned doing a walkthrough and we were kind of hoping to do that. I mean, Sean didn't care, but I was hoping to kind of see it. But the first time we saw the sphere and everything is right when we started our walk. Cause I noticed that he had that look on his face. And he started looking around. He started looking you around. You see his eyes looking around and it's just, it's not the norm that we see from Sean when he is coming out for a fight. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. And he, he says it really didn't affect him. Um, but maybe subconsciously it could have affected him a little bit, but it's, it's hard to say. And it's hard yeah. to just make up ex an excuse, you know, I just, well, we're, we're used to walking out and it's a, it's a three sixty arena, right? Now this time you're walking out, it's only like basically half the arena and it goes straight up with a huge screen. I mean, it's something you've never experienced before. A little bit of that awe factor was there. It look, and I saw a little bit of that look on his face. He wasn't the only one that I saw it though on, no. you know, there was all the other fighters were like, 
It, it was kind of the same thing. It was like, oh shit, this is this is amazing. You, like, this is you would great. see a fighter look over off of his right or left shoulder yeah. and go like oh, this because they're looking at a 50, 55 to seventy five foot tall picture of them moving, yeah, right. and it's like. Yeah, that would be a little bit weird. Yeah. Yeah, it felt like it, it felt so futuristic and it felt yeah. like literally we were in a movie. It didn't even seem like real life. It was it was pretty crazy and I knew in that fight I I knew the only way Mirab is going to take down Sean is if Sean sits down and he overcommits. Overcommits mm -hmm. on a punch and uh he did that a few times and and if he doesn't give away those two clean takedowns that Mirab got, I think the fight changes a bit. Uh but like I said, back to the drawing board. And once we get this fixed, it's going to wake up a whole new demon with Sean, just the type of kid he is. Do we have a time frame on the surgery and, you know, where it's going to be at? Is it going to be in Arizona or is it going to be in Vegas or October 3rd? And the surgery is going to be in Arizona, in with, Arizona. A, with a really good surgeon. So hopefully we can knock it out. Hopefully, and then by December, the, hopefully by December, we're back to training. If you're looking to do MMA bets, there is no one better than BetUS. I'm telling you right now, they are fantastic. The odds are great. And right now, if you use our promo code of YouTube150, you will get 150% on top of what you put in up to $2,000. And if you do it and you add more money later on, it's 125%. So they even add on top of it. BetUS is the very best when it comes to MMA gambling. If you want to make a bet on a fight, you know a fight that's going to win, I'm telling you right now, go to BetUS, use that code, YouTube150, and you'll get that 150% on top of what you put down. You can also use them for NFL, NBA, any of the sports that are available on BetUS. YouTube150 is your promo code, 150% bonus on your first deposit, 125% bonus on your next two deposits. Don't miss out. Go to BetUS. It's crazy. Oh, back to training. That's that's a good turnaround. That's there. good. So mm -hmm. is it really just it's just a repair on the labrum tear, correct? I'm not exactly sure, but I'm pretty sure that's yeah. What it Unless is. something when they get in there, they'll try to see if there's anything else in there that that may need to get fixed. Yeah, the, the doctors go. Yeah, I see it on the MRI. Yeah, you know, but if I get in there, I may have to fix some other stuff. There's always mm -hmm. something, you know, especially in our industry. <laughs> hey, jo hey, John, I had a question. A question for you. I was curious. I mean, some of our call outs have Marab's name in it. Yeah. And and at the beginning of the fight, I wasn't obnoxiously yelling at Marab. I said I said Marab, Mar I said Marab, you need to be patient. That's what I said. Okay. And, he, and he heard me and that's when he started freaking out and running around the cage. And I'm just curious for you, would you have called a timeout then or kind of got in the middle? I would have I'm being honest, I would have talked to you in the beginning. And 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 Herb, to, and, and Herb did. And Herb and did. Talked, he talked and said, "Hey, look, I need you to understand." I cannot have you talking to the opponent in any fashion. Mm -hmm. So when you say Marab, you've got to look out. Even if it's a call sign for you guys, you're mm -hmm. making it sound like you're talking to the opponent. So okay. right away, I, I would have said, hey, I'm telling you now, stop. We talked about this. If you do it again, I'm going to remove you mm -hmm. from this arena, which I don't want to do. Obviously, that would affect your, yeah. your fighter and everything. So it's the last thing you want to do. But yeah. It's right in the rules that the one thing you can talk to Sean all you want. Mm -hmm. And we want you to be able to coach and talk to him and give him good, you know, feedback. But we cannot have you in any fashion talking to the opponent or talking to the referee during the round. It's, I, you know, I'll go in the back and I'll say, Hey, if you want to talk to me between rounds, you can say anything you want to me. You can call me an asshole. You can call me all that stuff. I don't care. If you start talking to me during the round, I'm going to have a problem with you. And okay. so all of that, it, it's just, it's in the, it's in the rules. And it's one of the things that it used to, we didn't, we didn't care. And then it started to have a problem and you started to have corners starting to actually wanting to fight. And so yeah. we just took it away. And that's why I was, I, I mean, I was, it wasn't trying to be obnoxious and yelling, yelling, yelling. Yeah. So if we, so from going forward, we cannot have the opponent's name in our call outs. You should not never, okay. it's going to cause you a problem. Okay. Especially you know. now that it's public that you guys do that, every ref's going to come in first thing they're going to say. Yeah, is, well, hey. and every corner, yeah. every every opponent that you're going to fight from now on, their corner, the first thing they're going to say to the referee when he walks in to talk to them, yeah. hey, I know that he starts talking to my fighter, and I, and I know that's not, and, and it's just going to be this yeah. thing. So, yeah, for you right now, I would tell you, yeah, just, you know, step away from that. You can call it out on any other Mm -hmm. fighter's name or anything you want doesn't matter not not the one the name of the opponent though good to know
Yeah, if you follow anything with like Mark, is it uh, Mark Henry, right? Uh, yeah, uh, he Henry. does the numbers from New Jersey. Yeah, he's like yes. 67, 24, 32. Yep. I'm sorry, I can't do math when I'm fighting. Okay, it just does not me. <laughs> you're not but, crazy. <laughs> but yeah, that's one of those things. I mean, yeah, you just start thinking of, of other ways to kind of, you know, you, use, you know, use your name, use somebody else's name. But yeah, but change it up somehow. Somewhere. And Tim, there's, I'm out. After this, I'll give you my phone number. You ever have a question on any rule, anything at all, give me a call and I'll answer Sweet. for you. Okay, sounds good. I appreciate it. Yeah, no I'm problem. constantly calling uh, John and just asking him, like, hey, was that right? Was he goes, is that right? Yeah, you, know. <laughs> you know, I'll be honest. You had you had an instance in that fight, and and it's, this is where I talk about, you know, I, I just talked about it on uh, Anik and Florian's podcast, is Herb was set up for you to say something because he I knew he talked to you before yes and I, and I said you know i'm sure he talked to tim he told me can't do it and as soon as tim said the name of marab i said it just key he knew exactly what he was going to do mm -hmm. you know he's going to stop the action all the stuff i go where herb ended up being indecisive was when marab had sean up against the cage and started kissing his back and then got up and turned yes i go that that took herb and kind of threw him off he wasn't he was not prepared for a fighter to be kissing another fighter <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it just he wasn't and he didn't know what to do and he and he was delayed in his reactions and he didn't he wasn't decisive because at the time you've got to look and say this isn't boxing and and i learned this whole thing from a boxing match where i watched a guy get kissed and and you know you had heath herring and nagao at the start of a fight long ago in japan that it happened but i watched it and i watched what the referee did i said okay i i, I know what what i, what I would do so automatically, I know what I'm going to do. Well, when Marab gets up, that round is still going. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a 360 degree sport. MMA, well, you're allowed to attack the back. Mm -hmm. You know, you obviously can't hit the spine, but you know, Sean could have gotten up. Herb kind of got in the way because he he was thinking of trying to do something about what Marab did, and he just didn't know what to do. And so it kind of just the time went by, and then the end of the round comes, and it it was a chance for. Sean, if and sh you can see Sean's getting up and he's starting to go mm -hmm. after him, it was a chance for Sean to land a shot. Yeah, I mean, I mean, his hip did kind of hit him. He wasn't able to turn over his hip and, and sit into that punch as much as he wanted to. Um, but it's the way she goes. That's the way she goes. It's, you know, that's it. And it's, it, look at none of us are going to make the perfect choice. Yeah. You know, every time it just can't happen. Sometimes when you think about something beforehand, you'll react and do what you thought about. When you haven't thought of something happening and then it's happening, it's like, what the hell do I do? It becomes the problem. Yeah. When you look back and you watch over the fight, what what exactly – was there things that just didn't seem like that Sean was firing all cylinders or did it seem like this Marab was a little more for, – for John and I, I think I say herky-jerky. Like he gets in there, he has that, that Keith Jardine. I don't even know if you know if Keith is. Yeah. But, you know, yes. he has that herky-jerky kind of feel to him and a lot of fighters have a hard time with that. And um, and that's kind of what Marab was a little bit more. I I would say probably more like a Lyoto Machida. There's a lot of little feints, a lot of little bouncing around, up and down, in and out, wide stance. I mean, what I saw kind of from my side, and and I don't know what you saw from your side, was that Sean was really having a hard time on just not understanding, not understanding, but just not figuring out the speed of Marab because he bounces in one spot, then he steps away, then he bounces in one spot, and as if you overcommit, like you said, on one or two shots that get the takedown, it gets in it's deep. like, ah, shit. Then it starts to get into your psyche a little bit of, okay, I can't overreach. He's staying just on the outside. I mean, is that what you were seeing kind of in that fight, or what else were what, what other things that were kind of frustrating you as a coach? Yeah, I mean, it kind of surprised, surprised me a little bit just at the beginning of each round, the first two minutes, he was pr pretty much running away, just mm -hmm. bouncing completely out of range, running left, running uh, right. And Sean kind of was just standing there waiting for him, following him and waiting for him when that, that could have been a good time for Sean to be a little more active. Cause I know when you're backing up, it's a lot harder to shoot. Yeah. Um, but like I said, he did disguise it. Good. He did disguise it. Good. A lot of times he's looking down with his eyes and he's changing levels in the open, kind of making start uh, freezing Sean up a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else. And I mean, when Marab's around his waist, that's not, we knew that that's where he loves to be. And there's plenty of times where Sean could have rolled for a knee bar, put it to 50, 50, hit a hard switch, hit a Granby, created a scramble there. But I think a lot of the times Sean felt like he gave away those rounds, especially uh, rounds two and four. He's like, I kind of gave him away. So he didn't want to expose a bunch of energy trying to create a scramble when yeah. looking back on of it, 
he should have, but he did get a lot of confidence from that fight too. It's like the first time going five rounds with someone who's going to wrestle you and grapple you, you're really, you're kind of not sure about it. But so he did get some confidence from that fight too. But looking back, he does regret not creating jujitsu scrambles and creating wrestling scrambles and off that, that body lock and just kind of letting him, letting him cook the clock like he does. I mean, do you, I, I look at Sean in terms of like, he's done so much in the short period of time in his career, but he's still young. And it's like to mm -hmm. think like Marab's, you know, Marab's older, like not old, I'm saying like, but you know, these guys have been around for a long period of time. He is just coming into his own and actually and already is a former champion, but a champion. And now it's just like, look, now I just got to get healthy, take care of my body, fine tune here and there, spend more time obviously on the mat because you know, the hip will be hopefully a hundred percent by the time we get back. I mean, I feel like, where do you feel like his, his end cap is like his ceiling is? Cause I feel like for him and we, we haven't even seen the potential of what he could do. Yeah. I mean that he even knows it too. I mean that the ceiling of how good he could get at even jujitsu, um, wrestling is is so high if we can just spend time there and be in the wrestling room and in the jiu-jitsu room he's not as strong as he could be and he's not as fast as he could be and his grappling is not even near as close as it could be he's very flexible he could be very very dangerous almost like charles Oliveira, mm -hmm. where people don't even want to go into his guard yeah. um he he knows it too so excited to just get this over with and get back to work because like you said these next probably these next four or five years are going to be his prime and he knows it and all the coaches know it so excited to get get to fucking work from the point that it's this is maybe a long drawn out question but you as his coach as 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 you guys were you know going up the ranks and fighting better opponents and then you finally get that championship fight because it's always easy when you have that target you're looking at and you can point towards this is what we want to get to and then you get to the point now you're champion you beat aljo now you're champion and there's a lot more as far as requirements made of the champion he doesn't have as much time to train everything kind of gets in the way the the media you know wants to talk to you the ufc will need you to come here for this thing or that did any of that in any way change the way that you as a coach started looking at what you needed to do for t for uh sean. sean or as far as was he in any way feeling pressure by having to do all those things because that's something when you're not the champion, you don't really know about it. You mm -hmm. kind of hear, but then you, when it's happening, it's a big load. Did you change anything for it? Or do you think now after this fight, you guys would change something? Uh ever since probably after his second third fight in the ufc he's always always has a camera on him people are always want to do interviews he's got opportunities to go with celebs and go and do all these things and he does have to make a lot of decisions and i think a little bit i mean does get decision fatigue and gets really tired of making these decisions all the time and i think that I think that adds up more than he thinks it does. Um, but that's definitely something the next fights and stuff will try to completely, if the, if the Cardinals, if the NFL team wants that you to come and work out with them, or if this person wants to go to this movie, movie premiere or whatever, just, just saying no to it. Um, but his whole career, he's had a lot of cameras on him and a lot of opportunities. Uh, but I think you're right. Just saying no to all that, especially when we're eight weeks from the fight is important. Was there something different about this fight, though, in terms of the media from the press fights? I know this because of Noche and it being at the Sphere and celebs coming out like nonstop talking to him going, hey, I'm going to be there. Was there something? Was it a little bit more this fight because he was the main event, because it was at the Sphere, because it was Noche, because it was all of these things? Was there more? For him to a do. lot of becauses it was but it was yeah. a lot <laughs> yeah I, I don't man i don't really think so he all week the everything was good and usually he's pretty open to me about how he's feeling mentally and everything was good he was a little lighter than he usually is but the weight cut was good and we had just as much pressure and if not more stress against aljo when it's like fuck we haven't grappled for six plus weeks we haven't even pummeled for a long time mm -hmm. and and it was in boston the main event the first title shot so there was a lot more pressure on that fight but i mean i don't think that affected him too much but like i said it could have subconsciously and he's just not even talking about it but i don't i don't think so i guess um, without looking too far forward let's just say he gets you know he's, he's healthy let's say he's healthy by say you know march april kind of get ready for next year's uh international fight week would be like a great time to break out uh, or, you know, Cinco de Mayo, 
you know, um, in order to come back at Cinco de Mayo. Um, it just was one of those. If you look at the rankings now, obviously everyone's chomping at the bay to go, hey, we'd like to see him and Corey Sanhagen. There'd be no, not a whole Whoa. lot of grappling, a whole lot of wrestling, but the stand-up fight would be an absolute great fight. Is there any other people that are on in that ranking system that are kind of in your um, in your vision that you would like him to fight? Yeah, we sat, we sat kind of we we just went to a trip to Montana. Two of our guys fought in Montana, so we were able to talk about it a little bit. But we're trying to not think too much into it because a lot can change in the, in yeah. the next nine months with with all these guys. And I mean, any of these guys in the top five, we know eventually if he's fighting for five more years in the UFC, we're probably going to end up fighting them all. Yeah. Um. So. I mean, Figgy's on the list. Corey Sanhagen's on the list. Umar, Mur I know he really wants that Murab fight back. Um, so any of those guys, possibly Henry Cejudo, who knows about that? That would be that would be a good one. Um, but like I said, we'll see what's happening here in about six, seven months. What about the Henry thing? Like you guys are both in Arizona. Like, is there like a little crosstown rivalry? You guys bump each other at, at events. Go, yeah, I see you. I see. You. What's up? <laughs> no, no, no. I think if we if we bumped into him at event, he'd scurry away. Uh, uh, whoa! There's de there <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of shit talking. I think Henry's really, really jealous of Sugar, and I don't blame him. Um, but like I said, Henry's a fuck. Even though he's on a losing streak right now, he's still a problem. And he's, he's still, a problem, man. Oh, he's he's a problem. still an animal. But time's ticking for him. Yeah. Time's ticking. He, he's he, he's creeping up at 38 years old. And, uh, I mean, that would definitely be a sweet fight, especially if, who knows, they came to the Cardinal Stadium or something. Sugar versus Henry would be pretty cool. I mean, stylistically, that may, that makes for a really good fight. I mean, he's, a, he's very similar to what Marab is. Give him a good chance to get back into that wrestling category right up when his hip's fixed. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but what do you do? You see any any things out of Corey Sanhagen? Because I know that there's everyone talking about the Sugar and Corey Sanhagen fight. That's all people have asked me about. Is like, hey man, this would be the best fight they could make right after all this. Uh, what do you see in Corey that maybe you feel like you guys could, or how do you think Sean does with Corey? I got some good news, ladies and gentlemen. Our podcast, Weighing In, was the first podcast to ever partner with OnlyFans. Bringing you guys the best content we possibly can in the combat sports industry. We are making some leeway on bringing sports to the OnlyFans platform. Where top tier, world class athletes can connect with their fans. We're talking about combat sports athletes like Demetrius, Mighty Mouse Johnson, Chris Cyborg, Luke Rockhold, AJ McKee. You've also got pro surfers like Billy Kemper. <sighs> Some chilly news. I want you to head on over to the Wing In OnlyFans channel. More connection with our fans on our OnlyFans channel. Only available on OnlyFans. Man, Corey's a serious problem too. He because he, he he's another one who he doesn't um, give away his takedowns big time. He has such good timing on his takedowns, and he gets so deep, and then he gets on top. And I know his jujitsu is good too. Yeah. You see him get on top of people in half guard and um and and beat him up there. And I think that would probably be their plan against Sean is is taking him down. I think on the feet, I think Corey would be probably surprised about the speed and um and the ability to counter punch from Sean. And I think he would get. Uh, hit a few times and probably be looking to take Sean down. Um, but like I said, that's a, it's a very tough fight. So you, I'm going to go back just a little bit because he brought up Henry Cejudo and, and Henry's got his gym fight ready and all that. But you came out of the MMA lab. Yes. So did Sean. Cause when yep. I first watched Sean fight in the Dana white contenders, I was there refing. I didn't do his fight, but he was with the MMA lab. And yep. so were you. How is that relationship? Is everything good between you guys? You guys branched off. I know. Yeah, I mean, everything's really good. We, I mean, we learned so much from John Crouch and Benson Henderson for so many years, and it gave us a, such a good base being in that room with all those guys. And now they have Mario Bautista, who's fighting Jose Aldo coming up. They have Kyler Phillips, who's fighting Rob Kyler's Font. just a stud. stud. Yeah, and he and Kyler's training at our gym twice a week, and he he's, he's trains at the lab majority of the time too. And then they have Marcus McGee, who's fighting Jonathan Martinez. <laughs> he's, and, a, he's a tank. And then they have Man. Bryce Bryce Meredith, who's Bryce Meredith, um, yep, three three time, uh, two time NCAA finalist. Yep. And then we have this kid named Ezra Elliott coming up. We just have such animals to train with, but our relationship's uh, really good with the lab, and I'm so thankful for having them for years and years. 
They're just a good group of people, man. Every time I've ran into Benson, yep. even though him and I had fought, I mean, we've been friends since before we fought. And then after we fought, I think I felt like our relationship got a lot stronger after we fought. I mean, we bounced things off of each other. And uh, it was always good to see him, especially with his wife uh, when she was fighting for Bellator. Just, you know, just good people to be around. Yeah, the amount of stuff we've learned from Benson Henderson, just watching him in the room, the work ethic he brings into the room and him being a champion. Uh, yeah. we, we, we've learned so much from Benson. How many? How much uh, time does Sean get in there with uh, with guys like Benson and other guys that are in there? Uh, usually, we have our we have our competition grappling, so we have we try to get all black belts and all Division One wrestlers to come to our our grappling. Um, so as much as we can, as, as much it. as we can. Then we have Augusto Taquino Mendez, who's our jujitsu instructor, and he's he's one of the greatest. So. Yeah, he is. we're not we're not short on partners to give us good looks. That, that's always you know it's so difficult especially with getting guys at that size you know there's when you look at the good ones it's hard to get guys when you have someone like sean that they're going to give him a good look that is not an easy thing and so it's good that you have all those people out in arizona because arizona is stacked right now with some good yeah. fighters we were yeah. talking about that before and, and people and people that we trust, you know, who's not going to yeah. go in there and, and and just try to make a name and try to get a viral reel uh, off sparring Sean. People we trust who are able to who are able to push him, push him hard, and not try to not try to break him. I mean, like I said, not looking too far ahead and then looking back in this. I mean, was this all kind of surreal with you with uh, Sean coming off the uh, Contender Series and then making his run? And there was that little break though when it went from. He was fighting guys that like were matched up evenly with him, or he was significantly or not significant, but a little bit better than them. And he made it look very easy. Then, he, yeah. then all of a sudden, something clicked, and it was the Peter Yawn fight. I'm assuming that was the contract. Ooh. Like mm -hmm. you were still in the Contender Series <laughs> contract. Like this is not the money I want to be. I thought he was Peter smart Yon. for that. I thought it was brilliant. Yep. But um, when you guys took that Peter Yawn fight, what was it? Because I was like, man, this is a lot. This he, he I feel like he bit off more than he could chew. What was your guys' mentality leading up to that fight? I mean, that I mean, we we were all both such huge fans of Peter Young while he's in the UFC. Like, holy, this guy's a fucking Terminator. This yeah. guy damages people and he hurts people. But we have a lot of really good guys that size that are that much shorter than Sean. That that are kickboxers, and the sparring is so one sided when we go against these guys. They're probably not quite the level of Peter Young, but they're up there, up there, really, really good guys. So. We just knew stylistically, big cage, the height difference, uh, three five-minute rounds, scary fight, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but Sean was just fired up and excited for that and couldn't believe it. The one different thing was we went to Abu Dhabi, I think, 20 days early and traveling across country and then seeing everyone in their outfits in the background and then seeing Peter Yan look at us. That was like a, like a holy shit moment. But he really dug deep and got a lot of confidence from that fight for sure. How important is it? You just brought up the going to Abu Dhabi 20 days uh, beforehand. Alex Bahia just did a, an interview talking about going to fight. Is, are they fighting in Salt Lake or are they fighting in Denver? Salt Lake? Salt Lake. He's like, yeah. look, like the time I fought. At, That's at altitude, altitude also. Before, he said the time I fought at altitude before, I went out there uh, two weeks. He's like, this time I'm going out three. And I have history with this in terms of with Cain Velasquez and uh, Fabricio Verdum. When Cain lost his title to Verdum, they were in Mexico City. And Kane went out two weeks before. Well, Verdum had already fought, I believe, in Mexico City before. He went out Verdum, a month. Almost Verdum six. was out there for a month. Yeah, he was out there for a month. So how, That's how big 7,000 feet. How big of a difference do you see in your fighter when you guys get out there early? I think that was the the smartest thing we did against Peter Yon. Go out there little, literally three weeks early. I think Justin Gaethje said they went out there seven days before the Habib fight. And... uh and and even those guys, even those guys, the uh, the Russians, they knew that was a big mistake by Justin yeah. Gaethje, just with the fatigue and just everything's different. The time is completely different, so that was a a huge benefit to us going out there early. Just learning how to run, like it could be anything. You're just running with the dry with the dry heat, yeah. running with the dust in the air because you're out in the desert. Like there's all that dust that you're taking in. You've got to get your body acclimated to it. You've got to get everything going. You got to find the restaurants that you want to eat at too. Where can mm -hmm. I get good food? Where where is it healthy food? Where is it? those are all things? That's why Forrest Griffin. I don't know if you know this. He used to talk about. I don't leave and fight outside of Vegas. He's like because I got to find my restaurants. I got to find my. Field. I have a routine. Plus, he cut a lot of weight. But I yeah a lot. I feel that though. I, I understand that after years of fighting, when I was fighting in San Jose all the time, 
I didn't want to leave anymore. I was like, hey, you know, UFC. Then we went, I went back to the UFC. We want you to fight over here. I was like, Ugh. I hated fighting outside of San Jose. I was like, no, man, I want to sleep in my own bed. I want to make my own breakfast. Keep that routine. Is it hard when you guys travel from location to location in uh, finding your routine and getting back on it? Yeah, for sure. Especially with how with how strict he is with his diet. Sean's one of those guys. He does not cheat on his diet. No cheat meals. Like he's so dialed when he decides to do his diet, mm -hmm. he is dialed in on it. So yeah, exactly what you said. Going to another city, seeing where you can get good chicken and is it fresh? <laughs> what kind of oils was it cooked in? And then yeah. how much lighting do we have to cover up in this room to get it actually pitch black? And there's a whole whole list of things. But we work with this guy named Dan Garner who has everything perfect for us. If, it, if the time zones are changing, he's going to show us how to acclimate to that time zone. And, um, and then we have another guy who helps us, the owner of Sanibel, his name is Imran. And he, he's really good at just making sure all the foods are good. And we were completely taken care of top to bottom. So that's awesome. Tim, what, I mean, one of my questions, as far as working with someone like Sean, Sean is like that free spirit and he, and he makes everyone almost look you know feel like he doesn't take things serious even though we know you don't get as good as he is unless yeah. you take it very serious when you're working with him is there anything that you look at that drives you crazy about him that you would change or is you know what you guys just seamlessly work together perfectly yeah he's pretty good at being honest with me and i tr i trust him That's i good. trust him when he when he says like his body's not ready for this workout i know it's not him being lazy I, I trust that he knows his body best and he's not trying to skip out on anything tough he's down to do anything tough so i really trust him and then when it comes to combos there's nothing i'm really stubborn with like hey you have to do it this way no 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 you have to do it this way because his whole life he's never um reacted good to coaches that are just like stern and saying this this is my way or the highway this is the way to do it and even in the even in that fight i mean i was getting a lot of flack for not yelling at him and firing him up but i'm like he just doesn't i've been around him for almost you know who 11, he is yeah. 11 12 years so I, he doesn't like to be screamed at like that and uh I mean, I, it, at, in that fourth round, I said, hey, we're almost done with this. And I should have used, uh, used different <laughs> words. I should have said, hey, we got five minutes left. That, yeah. that completely changes everything. But, I mean, he knew what I was talking about. He came to the back from the corner just kind of defeated and slouched. Saying, but, hey, we're almost done with this. Like, we got five more minutes. You can still clip this guy. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he just doesn't respond to screaming like that. But we have a really good relationship. He really trusts me, and I really trust him. So, so when he says he doesn't want to do something or I don't really like this combo, I feel off balance or something, then we just we just fix it right away. That's very important because I was very much the same way with my coach Javier Mendez. Is he would throw a combination and I was like, it just I'd do it for the you know for whatever 20, 30 minutes, and then I I try and try it in sparring later on in the day. I'd be like, yeah, it's just not working for me. And he said, okay, then we throw it out. It was mm -hmm. it's good to have that communication with your coach because when they start trying to force techniques that are just not working for your body, it can Never really put you work. in a compromising position, especially in the fight. But you brought up that he doesn't like to have coaches that yell or kind of raise their voice at him and stuff like that. How did this relationship happen between you and him? Obviously, it started probably at the lab, I would assume. And then how did it grow from there? And how did you guys decide like, hey, you know what? We're going to just do our own thing on the outside. Yeah, I think uh, I was, we were, we're both from Montana. So we're both from cities that are an hour apart from each other. And at, Where at in time, Montana? I'm from, from? Great, I'm from Great Falls, Montana. He's from Helena, Montana. Okay. Okay. You're in a better place. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be in Helena. It's the capital. It's <laughs> uh, and then, so I went up there to commentate some fights and I remember seeing him when he's 16 years old, kickboxing, little skinny kid. I'm like, oh, he's pretty athletic, but I, he probably won't stick with it. And not many people stick with it. Yeah. And then I, I went to commentate some fights and then he was fighting again. He's fighting this college wrestler. I'm like, this college wrestler is going to probably whoop his ass. And then, uh, he arm barred the kid, hit a nice arm bar. And then after I went up to him and I said, Hey, I have a spot on my couch. Do you want to come stay for a week and train at a real gym with me? And he just like lit up. He was so excited. He came down for a week. And as soon as I picked him up from the airport, he's like, Hey man, we're going to go to the top. We're going to do, we're going to go all the way to the top of this. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, bro, you have no idea. No yeah. idea. The, the, the <laughs> level of guys in this sport. He's never went with a real professional or a real black belt in jujitsu and he got beat up really really bad and he was crying after practices and i mean most people would be demoralized from that and be defeated but he ended up going home saving two thousand dollars driving his car down moved down and we ended up getting an apartment together 
It's funny. Yeah. I just told the story of what last week, John, about the BJ Penn situation. I know I was training AK. BJ Penn was training AK with Frank Shamrock. It was the three of us and some other guys, you know, Bob Cook and other guys. And um, they kept talking to me about how BJ Penn was so great. So great. He's this, he's that. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Oh, he mounted Frank. Frank couldn't get out. I'm like, ah, whatever, man. So they brought him in one night because I only trained at night because I had a full time job and I was still, you know, working during the day. They brought him in at night, man. He fucked me up. <laughs> he tapped me in like five times in five minutes. I within 30 seconds, he had my back one arm trap choking me with one arm. He just <laughs> mopped it. I went to work the next day, quit my job. And the rest is history, brother. Like it, you have to make those life choices. And the, the sport was is evolving so much so fast. And if you're not ingrained in it, you're never going to be able to catch it. You'll never get to the title. You'll never be able to get there. Even if you do do all these things just right. You have to have the perfect night that night to win the title. Those there's so many things, and he's he's on track. Like not, I mean, he's already been the champion, but I'm saying like he's still young. He has so much yeah. growth to do, and I think once he gets in, once he gets healthy, psh, the sky's the limit, man. The speed, the movement, the range, his body style, and I've said this for I don't know how long. That tall, long, and lanky body style. Look in history of MMA; it's a problem. It's, it's yeah. a problem for everyone. Anderson Silva was that way. John Jones, the greatest to ever do it that way. Even GSP, if you look at him compared to the other guys that he was fighting at that time, he's kind of considered a tall, long and lanky guy. And so Israel. Yeah. It, yeah. Israel out of science. Exactly. The style is there. Those are the guys. Max Holloway. Are, yeah. Max Holloway. Those are the guys that are problems, man. And Sean just falls right into that. And he can do a lot of, he knew a lot of everything really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and I've always told them too, it's so impressive. I mean, when people are undefeated and they're confident, of course they're going to be confident when they're undefeated. But I have so much respect for guys like Jorge Mazadal or, or, or Nate Diaz or, or these guys with all these losses, Charles Oliveira with all these losses that lose and then they fight their way back to the title. Yep. I'm like, that's a whole nother uh, type of beast. And now he gets to, to show that. Yeah, those are those Tim, guys that this, quit though. Those are the guys. Sorry, John. Those are the yeah, guys no, that no. end up like you never see them again after like they made their way back three or four times. They made their way back. Yeah. So it was a yeah, lot of hard fucking beasts. Tim, you're but you're thirty four, thirty four. You're you're still a young man. You I you stopped fighting. I wa again. I watched you fight uh, live when you uh, tried to go into the Ultimate Fighter and they had to fight into the house. Yes, and. uh you stopped fighting somewhere back around 27, same time I retired, 2017, 2018, right there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what made you decide tr being the, being the trainer, being a guy who is going to put up with all of this crap, being the guy that's going to have to sit here and be on the outside of the cage, telling the guy what to do. And when he's doing it, it's great. And when he's, when he's, when he's not, I'm going to have to sit there and just bite my tongue. Yeah, it's not an easy job. It's a difficult job, and I, I tell people all the time: the, the worst job in MMA, in my opinion, is being the trainer because it is so difficult to be good at it. And you've done a fantastic job with Sean. I just want you to do that. I don't care about what anyone has said. You're a great corner man. You're a great trainer. What was it that told you I'm going to stop fighting and I'm going to I'm going to start being a trainer? Yeah, I mean, I've my whole goal, my whole life was like, man, I'm gonna get in the UFC. I'm gonna get in the UFC, and then I I lost. I mean, I tore my bicep real bad in that Ultimate Fighter fight. Dana said, win three more, and then we'll bring you back. Won three more, didn't bring me back. So I I took this fight against this Canadian guy. I was, thought it was gonna be easy fight. Went up there, super confident, broke my jaw, mm -hmm. broke my jaw really severe, like jaw break. And then I went to the hospital, and they're like, hey, it's Friday night. The surgeon doesn't get in till Monday, so. <sighs> You got to go. My jaw's like Jesus. disconnected. And um, that feels good. <laughs> yeah. So I had to travel to another city two days with that jaw dis disconnected, get, uh. get surgery, get wired up. But that, so I had three back to back surgeries, completely ruptured, tore this bicep on my shoulder. A year later, completely tore, ruptured this bicep on my shoulder. Uh, a year later, broke my jaw. And I was just like, I was like, man, I fucking love this sport so much. And now I'm having all these bills from surgery. The promotions aren't paying my surgery bills. And my main thing I love so much is just being in practice with the guys, pushing each other, yeah. being competitive, having a good time. And um, while I'm healing from those these surgeries, I'm still uh, helping Sean and, and kind of being, being his coach and stuff. And it, and it just kind of – I, I really fell in love with the gi jiu jitsu and I started teaching a gi jiu jitsu program. They shut down that program, then an opportunity to open my own program and it just kind of formed, it went on from there. I'm like, well, 
Now I get to still go to practice, still be here every day. And now I get to make more money than I've ever made fighting. Yeah. And uh, I don't have to have surgeries all the time. And I, I was just like, well, I mean, this is, this is kind of a good route. Cause I never really officially retired. I was just kind of like, well, now that I can't train right now that I'm just going to help my guys. So it's kind of how it happened. So who are the guys I'm gonna, we'll get you out of here in about a minute or two. No, but who, who, who are the guys that you're going to say that you guys are training with? Give me those guys. I know you listed them earlier, but they are saying, Hey, it has a good chance of making that next run of the title, make it or making a run into the UFC. Who are the guys you train with that are there? I mean, for, for bantamweights from the lab, it's just so, so stacked. Mario yeah. Bautista, if he beats Jose Aldo, then that's going to stud. That's going to put him into the top five. Kyler Phillips, if he beats Rob Font, I think that's going to put him right up in there in the top top eight, I believe. And then Marcus McGee, who's who is an absolute animal. I think he's got three finishes in the UFC now. Now he's fighting Jonathan Martinez. So there's a good chance that there's four guys in the top ten at least that are our buddies and our training partners. And then not that's not even talking about the the bantam weights that we have that aren't even in the UFC that are absolute monsters. So where does that put you guys though? Like, is there, is there, Hey, if, only for the title we fight, I you know this is the conversation that we've yeah. always had. It's as old as time, man. Like, Hey, are you fighting your guys to get to the number one title shot? Are you guys fight each other only for the title? Is there that understanding or is it just, Hey, whatever they present? I mean, I feel like if it's for the title, it would be just so hard to get Sean up for that. Mm -hmm. If it's for the title, obviously they're going to, they're going to take the fight and it's just, hopefully we can avoid that as much as possible. I know, I know Sean's going to have big fights regardless of who it is. And I know Dana's about to start a boxing promotion too. And with his boxing promotion, Sean would be very interested. I in that. told you that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if, if we can, if we can avoid fighting those guys who we grew up with and watched grow, who we know their family, it's like, if we can avoid that, then, then we're yeah. going to try to avoid it. My farm needs the earth, the air and the water. I get my energy going on element electrolyte drink mix. Clean, good tasting energy that feeds me like I feed my plants and animals. And after a long day on the tractor, when it's time to shoot the podcast, I drink Element so that I can stay energized and stay salty. Let's get it on. Now, I know there's been talk with him. Uh, he's been chirping a little bit of Ilya Taporia. Stylistically, it makes for a very fun fight. Taporia being mm -hmm. shorter, you know, he's got the power, but he's shorter, doesn't have the reach as Sean, does probably not as fast as Sean, you know, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, is is it like kind of is Sean like ah, I'm I could get tired of cutting weight here real quick and making a jump to forty five? I mean, he's got the build for it. He's he's yeah. definitely got the build for it, and he does do a very good job at outside of fight camp eating clean foods that aren't adding inflammation to his body. If he ate like normal people eat, he could, he would get above 160 pretty easily. I believe. Um, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's out of the picture, jumping up to 145, putting on four or five pounds of muscle and going up there. Cause like I said, he's got the build for it. There's no doubt. He has the ability at five eleven. It's amazing that he makes 135. It is, you know, and he's, you can tell physically, it's not like he's weak. He's, he's got leverage mm -hmm. strength. He understands where to put his hands, and you watch him fight. The one that I'm going to go back to the Peter Yan fight, and this was one of the most impressive things because I looked at that fight as when he was going out there and Josh and I had talked about it, I said, he's going to go out there and he's going to look across the cage and he's going to go, oh, shit, that's Peter Yan. <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah. it happens with all fighters at a certain point. You, know, you look across, you go, oh, shit, that's the guy I've been watching all this time. Mm -hmm. And I was amazed by how calm he was and the way that he handled everything in that fight just showed, oh, yeah, he's a mature fighter. He knows exactly where he's at, what he's doing. And now he's in the position of, I need to show everyone exactly what I've been hiding. And he and he did. He did an unbelievable job. But he has got to be fun to work with because he is talented. And he's talented when I say his jujitsu is freaking good. Mm. You know, it's not like it's, you know, it's lacking. It's good. It's right up there. His wrestling is actually better than people think, and his stand-up, obviously. His ability to control range and distance is usually just fantastic. 
Yeah, for sure. That I, I mean, you you guys know you've done jujitsu. I mean, when you're on bottom and you're not used to being on bottom and you're not doing these competition rounds and you're not being using your butterflies and pummeling your legs, it, it gets tiring real quick. So, like you said, I I know how he is very good at jujitsu, but we didn't really get to show it as much as I wanted that fight. But that's why I'm just itching to get to the next fight, get this surgery done, and to really show how good actually at jujitsu he is. Sometimes coming off, I'm. Um you know, a surgery or an injury and then being motivated to get back, which I feel like he will be helps. It's going to be, it's going to be a big deal. So they're, you, they'll eat clean. Fighters will eat clean. They'll take care of their body. They'll lift. They'll do everything they can outside of, you know, what they can't do is the grappling, the wrestling. He'll lift some weight to put on the weight properly. All those things stay fresh with the arms. It does. It does motivate you to get you back a little bit faster. I've been through it a couple of times, unfortunately, but it definitely was a motivation factor. What was your longest surgery you were out for? Well, I had a, I broke my ankle and I had a plate put in with nine screws. And what happened was when I broke it, I was supposed to fight Gil for the second fight. And then when I broke it, the doctor said, hey, you're clear. I came back to training and he's okay. You're clear to kick second or third kick. I broke it above the plate. Ooh, so I broke fuck. it again. So then there was nothing they could do except they just casted it. Put, a, put me in a walking boot and cast a hard cast over the top with the ace bandage wrap. Did that. Uh, that was only probably about 10 to 12 weeks. But then the thing was, is it went from there. Then I broke it a third time above that part. It's because it calcified the bone calcified again. And I broke it above that. So I broke it three more times after that, every time I went to kick. So if you go back and watch my second fight with Gil, I didn't really kick a whole lot because I was afraid that, you know, I could, I wasn't kicking during camp. It wasn't repetition anymore. And so I was out for about 19 months, 18, Does it still, 18 months. Still give you pain? Oh, because you kick the, if you kick and you land on the plate, it hurts like hell. So Ouch. if you, yeah, if you kick the elbow and it hits the plate at all, oh, it's painful, man. It's almost to the point of dropping you and anything to do with flexion where your, your ankle has to flex. Like if I catch the toes, it's torture that hurts too. And then lastly is like if any, any ankle locks, any, uh, uh straight foot locks, yeah, straight foot locks on that leg, it's painful, super uh. painful. Yeah. So those are certain things you have to learn to work around. You know, I wasn't able to, uh, once guys started attacking my ankles, man, I was getting out as fast as I possibly could or just tapping, you know, especially in training, mm -hmm. just tap, live to fight another day kind of thing. Yeah. But, I, I'm just 10 minutes or 10 months post, uh, Achilles. I blew my Achilles completely off my, Oh, ankles. I've done that. Have you? That's uh, I had both done. How'd you, you do you tore them both completely? I no, I tore one completely. And then they went and looked at the other side and they said, uh, this one's going to pop too. Oh, <laughs> so Damn. I ended up having both of them done. Oh, yeah. it's I mean, a I'm lot of fun, isn't it? <laughs> Holy smokes. I'm finally getting confidence in it, pushing off, shooting again and defending ankle locks and stuff. So it feels yeah. good to be getting back to healthy. We've been jacking stem cells into it. Um, all sorts of shit. So it should be strong now. Have you guys, yeah. where, where do you guys do your stem cells at? Uh, we've done them at CPI before in Tijuana. And then we've also done them at, uh, well, not we, me at ways to well in Texas. Gotcha. Okay. A oh, ways to yeah. well in Texas. Where's that located at in Texas? I'm pretty sure it's in Austin, Texas. Okay. It's the one Joe Rogan raves about all the time. Those guys yeah. are pretty good at taking care of like MMA people and stuff. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've gone CPI as well, and I live in Texas now, so I moved out of California, moved to Texas. But uh, yeah, the CPI is great, man. Scotty down there, those guys, Ed, and those Hell guys yeah. are just great. Clay, they're all so nice, man. Good guys, great facility. Uh, Thankful for the one. Thankful for those guys that take care of us, the old beat up dogs, huh? Yeah, yeah right. Because normally we don't get any love after you retire, man. You're not <laughs> if you're not in the spotlight anymore. You don't get no love, but man, no, they he definitely took care of me, man. They're great people too, and I've known Scotty for pushing twenty years now. I think. So How long have you guys been doing your podcast mm -hmm. now? We started right five before years, COVID. Yeah, we started right before COVID, so five years. Damn, yeah. that's awesome. And you've done so. What episode are you guys on so far? We just broke five hundred. This is Damn. like this is like five oh five five yeah five ten five fifteen right now yeah. or something like that. That's awesome. I always I mean I always see these new podcasts popping up. I'm like yeah. I give it ten episodes, ten episodes, and they're gonna be done. <laughs> That's that was the biggest thing. Like I it's, keep I keep telling people like if you're a fighter and you're retired or you're a fighter that just wants to get something going, man, hit me up, man. We'll get you guys on. Talk about your show. I think what happens. Uh, I was talking to Anik too when we had Anik on. I'm like, man, MMA guys don't support each other. You know, and that's yeah. what's great about Rogan. Rogan's me always too. like, hey, let me get you on. Let me, he's, he's, he doesn't need to have MMA guys on. He does. Yeah. You know, he had me on his show in uh, 2020, I think February 2020 or something like that. 
it's just a it's a big deal man like trying to do what you can to help pump everybody else up it's important it's important because like at the end of all this and it's all said and done it's like i'm gonna remember the people that really kind of hey let me help you for a second if even if it's just to get me on for 20 minutes even if it's to get me on for an hour whatever it is it does it does something it helps and if we don't stick together man it's it, it you're really ruining things for for everybody in the future and i agree you say yeah it's gonna last 10 episodes because people, I think in, in the MMA world, ah, they just expect when they jump in because they see everyone else doing it, ah, it's going to make me money right away. Oh, it's easy. It doesn't work that way. I wish it yeah. did. It doesn't right. work that way. It's like anything. You got to work at it. Yeah. But it has to do with just helping each other out. Like we all jump on each other's shows and we all make it and we all talk positive about each other, man. It's a, it's a good place to be. Definitely a good place. Yeah. I mean, especially, I mean, you guys got each other. So no, yeah. regardless, you guys are going to show up. That's kind of how it was when we started the Timbo sugar show too. I think we're at six years now. Dude. We started it and just some Sundays we're just like, fuck, nothing to talk about. We don't want to do it, but we still just bite the bullet and, and get in there. And I definitely think, I mean, the consistency over all these years definitely has helped, but I'd love to have you guys on, on, on my show sometime too. Absolutely. Anytime, anytime, anytime. Man. hit us up anytime. Yeah. I, I look at I, it. I, Go ahead, John. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I've watched your show. You guys crack me up. <laughs> okay. Because sometimes you guys get off on the wildest shit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we do. Yes. <laughs> we like, do. Those are the it's days like, that they didn't want to go. There was nothing uh, to talk about. So let's it. just talk probably, about this. It. Yeah, I hear I hear some of the things we talked about four years ago. I'm like, oh, now that's on the internet forever. <laughs> oh, yeah. Forever. It never goes away. The internet's well, and, undefeated, and, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and and Dana White had a dinner with us, and he's like, "Hey, do not talk about your personal lives on the uh, internet." Yeah. And we're like, "Fuck, it's hard." Fuck, <laughs> yeah, that's all we do. <laughs> that's all we do. Yeah. Uh, hey Tim, man, I want to thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate you. And like, as you guys get closer to his return, and maybe we'll check back in mid mid recovery, see if you can come back come back on, or if you know if if Sean wants to come on, please let him know. We'd love to have him. You know that Hell type yeah. of stuff. But yeah, man, I appreciate you. And Sweet. same thing, we will definitely, uh, anytime you want us on your show, we will be there. I want to tell you congratulations on all of your success. Yep. You have been fantastic. With Sean is uh, obviously not a bad fighter to have under the your right. control. So <laughs> I'm going to take a little bit away from it. Yeah, 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 uh, it. But seriously, you're doing a fantastic job. Keep up with it, Tim. And thank you very much for the time. Hell yeah. Thanks so much, you guys. Always, brother. All right. Talk soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Welch. <laughs>